in metaphysics, the two major, beside the appearance right distinction, the two big concepts that emerges is the idea of cosmology and the idea of ontology. Cosmology captures the appearance of a thing, the outside of it. Ontology captures the foundation, its essence, what it's made of, the deeper component of it. Sometime ontology is called met metaphysics or reality. But in real, real, real metaphysics, both of them are important because cosmology also need to be explained. So let us dive into the idea of cosmology right now. What is cosmology? You can look up the word and it'll say the study of the origin of the universe, one of the definition, but the root meaning of cosmology is a study of natural order. Remember metaphysics is a study of the physical world. And, and, and then when you look at the physical world, you say, why is it so orderly? If you don't appeal to a god or goddesses to create the world around you, why is it so orderly? Why is it natural phenomena, non-living thing, disordered? We know humans, we put order on things. We use our intelligence to build cars, to build houses, to build iPhones. We put order on things. What does nature get it if you don't appeal to a supernatural being of some kind? So the intellectual pursuit, the first intellectual pursuit is to understand order. Is order natural? Does it emerge naturally? How does it, how is it, how is it, it becomes natural? How, when disorder seems to be the go-to uh, position, right? When you look at uh, uh, cosmology, there's a couple of areas. You're looking at order. You look at the cosmos. You see the universe is so well ordered. Huh? It's well ordered. You may argue some parts are, are not um, clearly ordered, but that's, that's okay. But it is too ordered for it to be total chaos. It's hard to be all chaos. All right? Why do you have the order? Uh, then you have the natural elements on the planet. We'll talk about those. You don't have to go off to, to the universe. Right inside the planet itself, we have natural elements. Also on the planet, we have what is known as natural kinds. All of these areas are orders that we need to explain. If we're going to explain the reality, what's the reality of this order that we have? So let us look real quickly here into the idea of the universe, the study of the cosmos, which is the root meaning today. People want to know about the cosmos. <clears throat> when scientists say uh, cosmology is a study is of the universe, of the origin of the universe. They're not really saying literally, where does it come from? They're literally saying, where does the order come from? Because in the theory of science, there is a point of singularity, the blue dot in front of you right now, and everything is squished in together in one little space. And then there's a massive explosion, an expansion called the Big Bang. But when we blow things up, when we blow up a building, all right? When humans blow up a building, you have chaos. Now your the fundamental theory is saying that the universe blew up. But then you see order. Why isn't there chaos? And this is it's a very diff difficult problem for scientists to solve. They believe it still, but they can, haven't proved it completely because it just does not make logical sense. So they're working on it. This is still the fundamental, the current belief in that, okay? So also when you look at when you're looking at out in deep space, looking at the cosmos, you have, you're impressed by the idea of space and time. The cosmological bodies are floating in space, but is that space something or nothing? The ancient Greeks, the one we're gonna be looking at, at first, they didn't even think about it. So they treat it as if it was nothing. One philosopher, Parmenides argued it is absolutely nothing. Later, the philosopher began to say, it is something there because these things are moving in such a slow way a slow manner, so in a very precise way. So therefore, there's got to be something they're resting in. They call this thing the ether. Later, scientists came along. They reject the idea of the ether, and they, they call it space-time. They also agree there's something out there. The space is something. They like to call it space. Space is often nothing, but scientists call it space as something. OK? So instead of calling it the ether, but both the ancient philosophers and modern science agree there's something out there. And also there's the notion of time. Is time eternal? Is time, can you go back in time? This is a big question nowadays in metaphysics. Can you travel in time? Can you go in the future? Can you go in the past? 
Is there a global now? Right? These questions emerge in metaphysics. So, uh, so when you look at the idea of cosmology, one thing you're doing, you're trying to pursue these questions. And we're going to look at the ancient philosophers who tried to give answers to these. <clears throat> this order. Now, if you look in the planet, you have certain things we call elements. Elements means fundamental building blocks. Okay, it's fundamental building blocks. Not, in particular, not made by humans. Not artifacts, not artifacts, not made by humans. So you look into the world, what do you see? You see these building blocks. Number one, the earth element represents solidity. We may call it mass. Where does that come from? How do we have that? That's not made by human. It is the, everything around us has mass. So where does it come from? How is it manufactured? This is a question the ancient asked, okay? Then they have water, which represents liquidity. Where does the water come from? How does, what, from what nature, from what fundamental nature do you have an arising, arising actually of earth and water? Water is a fundamental, uh, a fundamental uh, element here, right? <clears throat> And then you have the idea of fire. And fire for the ancient really meant the fire as well, but also meant light and heat. The sun is a fire element. Why do we have light? Why do we have heat? This is the question the ancients asked. These questions are today the, the question, the driving question behind fundamental natural science, the natural sciences. Now we're looking at ther thermodynamics. And the ancients gave the first theory of light, which becomes the foundation of our electronics and, and this PowerPoint presentation here. So, and then there is the element of air. They couldn't see it, but they know they, they was breathing it in, but it's something there. And if you don't breathe the air, you die. In fact, if your body is, any of these natural elements completely removed from your body, you die. All right. Any of them completely removed, you die. All right. So fundamental to who you are. If you research and look up the Greeks' natural element, you say they have five natural elements. The fifth element is called ether, the space. Ultimately, ether became. We're going to be going so back in history before the rise of the ether, so we won't be mentioning it in this course except for in passing. But there is a fifth element going forward. When you get into Aristotle, you get, by that, that time, you get into uh, the idea of the ether. <clears throat> there is something out there. Well, shortly after Aristotle, there is something there, the ether, which is, represents space or volume. I'll talk about the ether a little more because it turned out to be a very significant part of all of this. And then where is, do else you have order? I won't even mention, I, I'll give you a few seconds to guess what, it, what are natural kinds. Well, did you guess? So you want to explain uh, reality by looking at nature itself, what nature has produced, not what cars and motorcycles. So what nature has produced is these things called li life forms. We call them natural kinds. Well, they're all, the, the ancient call them natural kinds. They're individual things made by nature and they're very unique. The horse is, the horse is a horse and the tiger is a tiger. Why? Why is that? If you don't appeal to a supernatural being, a God, which means that God has an intelligence, that's why God made the horse and God made the tiger. How do you explain that? Now in philosophy, even you appeal to a God, the question is why did God make horses? And why did God make tigers? And why does particular creatures? Is God limited in being able to create only certain creatures? The question remains. Outside of philosophy, when you look at the scientific eyes, they'll, they'll still try to explain this. This is very, very important. I want to say to you right now, one of the insights at this level here is that what you're looking at is what Plato's going to call forms, various shapes, okay? This is a construct, an application of the concept of the ether. See, when the ancient looked out in the sky, they saw a lot of space out there, and it is something. When you look at a horse, you're looking at something that's dimensionalized. It has space. It has a particular shape that is maintained. This is the presence of the ether. See? There is something odd about having birds flying in the sky, having a snake on the ground. These are different shapes. Why do you, where do you get that shape? The natural elements, 
earth, water, fire, and air, it's not going to become these particular shapes. What gives these things the shapes? This becomes a serious, serious challenge, even nowadays, as we try to explain this, this theory or this challenge to explain reality through science by the evolutionary theory. It's just still an attempt to explain this big question. And so when you're looking at it through the eyes of the philosopher, you're seeing the challenge. You don't have the answer the answer to the question yet, but you're seeing, hey, that's a unique thing. Horses and birds are different things. <laughs> so how do you, how you, how you get that from the natural elements? They may be made of the same stuff at, at the bottom, but how do you get those different shapes? And why, why do you have those shapes? And this, we can spread this concept further by looking at mountains, looking at the planet, uh, the, the stars, the moon, why you have those particular things? Why does this, this individuation in the natural kinds of this kind? <clears throat> so when we say cosmology, we're looking at natural order. And the best thing to understand about this part, before you begin theorizing, understand this is where we begin. This is the truth that anyone, you, anyone in the world, can look at and agree or disagree. Mostly people agree there's order. Even there's some disorder, there's order in these areas. So the cosmo cosmological question is where does it come from? How do you explain it? Most of what you call the natural science try to explain this. We're gonna see the first philosopher try, try to explain this as well, all right? Attempts to explain this often give rise to the idea that there is God and God is out in the world, all right? However, even if you propose and accept God, you still have the same philosophical drama, okay? Why did God prescribe those particular orders? Is God, him or herself limited to what he or she can produce in terms of these things here that we see in nature? So cosmology, where does the order come from? The order, my friend, is real. A horse really is a horse. The shape of the thing called a horse is really a horse. And if I confuse the horse for a statue of a horse, okay, still the shape, the cosmology of the horse is the shape itself. What it is ontologically, that's what makes it a real horse, okay? So the shape cosmologically, that's the horse. That's what you see. That's the appearance. But what it is underneath, if it's made of rocks, then ontologically, it's a statue, but it's made of flesh and blood, the stuff that produces flesh and blood. Ontologically, we call it a real horse, a living horse. 